guys, and welcome to the Moms and Murder podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? Oh, um, wow. We have uh, Freaky <laughs> Friday at ourselves. I'm doing pretty good, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just been a little bit of a hectic week. I feel like yeah. sometimes you have weeks when you're just like, I'm doing great and everything's going great and you know, everything's wonderful. But this was not that week for me. It was a very tough week. And as you know, we have been trying to record for like three nights and I have just been putting it off because I've been having so much craziness in my house. So thank you, Melissa, for dealing with me and all of my nonsense. I'm happy oh. to finally be recording. Of course. Well, I mean, this works both ways. There's plenty of weeks where I'm like, uh, we're on the way to the doctor or, you know, this has gone south. Yeah. Or can we just, <laughs> I don't think I can people anymore today. Can we do it the next day? So that's why we're a good team. It's it's back yeah. and forth, right? Right, uh, Did right. you hear one thing in crazy true crime news today um, about the Sherry Papini case? No. Do you remember her? You remember who she is, though, right? The um, lady who in California like five years ago, um, she was – she said she had been kidnapped. And oh, yeah. Yeah. So today she was arrested and they're <gasps> charging her with – yeah, like with fraud basically and saying she had went to an ex-boyfriend's house for like 22 days, panicked or whatever, branded herself. Remember, walked like in the middle of the road and they found her and like they're charging her with like – taking victims fund money because she was like in therapy for several years after that. All kinds of. Oh my just... gosh. Yeah. The details are kind of vague for me now, but I do kind of remember this story. I'm going to have to go look that up. No, I have not heard that yet. It's Reddit worthy. Like that's why I thought I could go in with it with you Ooh, because yeah. yeah, I know that's like <laughs> Reddit rabbit trails for you. But yeah. So when you're listening to this, hopefully we'll have more information, but yeah, it's kind of one of those wild days, one of those days you didn't know if it would ever happen. So kind of crazy. Yeah, I definitely am going to have to look into that. That'll be a perfect uh, rabbit hole for me to go down this weekend after my crazy and wild week. All right. Well, I have uh, not a rabbit hole for you today, just a really crazy story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm really excited to talk about this one. Actually, we always I feel like we have a lot of times when we say this is, you know, such an interesting story or this has so many interesting details. And this one really does again. So yeah, we mean it this week. We really week mean we it mean this mean time. It. <laughs> yeah, this is like, uh, there's just so much here. So we're just going to get right into it. Philip Height was a man who knew what he really wanted in life. And that was simply the perfect family. Of course, perfect is really subjective, but Philip built himself what he considered to be the perfect family. Philip's wife, Linda, who carried Philip's three sons, Craig, Chris, and Carrie, helped make Philip's dream a reality. The two met at the Chatham County Fair in Savannah, Georgia, and Linda was swept off of her feet immediately. She said that Philip stole her heart away. It wasn't long before their new love turned into marriage and soon parenthood. Philip and Linda raised their three boys in the Christian church, just as Philip had been raised. He had come to deeply cherish his faith, and he wanted nothing more than to raise his own family in the same way. Philip was a very strong-willed man, but his family was his number one priority. He would do absolutely anything to protect Linda and the boys, but he did run a pretty tight ship, and he expected everybody to be straight-lined, good, and moral. Philip was a perfectionist who just wanted to be the man of the house, but he was also very loving. So for her part, Linda was a very supportive wife to Philip, and she shared the same values, so she was willing to sacrifice a lot to build the family that she and Philip envisioned. Linda was a great mom and an honest and loving person. Together, she and Philip worked to raise their sons to be good, fine, church-going men that valued and believed in themselves and each other. Although these boys, who, as I said, were named Craig, Chris, and Carrie, all had pretty different personalities, they did grow up to be very close as brothers. Chris and Craig had the most in common with each other, and they enjoyed hunting and outdoorsy things, while Carrie was the baby of the family. The three boys grew up to be well-rounded, contributing members of society, and anybody looking from the outside would assume that this family had it all until a shocking double murder and one attempted murder revealed the trouble that had been brewing in the Height family for years. Philip Merton Height was born September 24th, 1948, and grew up well-liked, well-known, and well-respected. Philip was a private man who cared mostly about his business and his family, but he was also focused on his church and his community as a whole. Philip was, for lack of a better term, extremely popular. 
He was very active in the church and he served on the council multiple times. And he was a pro baseball mega fan, attending all the games and collecting all the memorabilia he could. After graduating high school, Philip went on to serve in the Georgia National Guard, where he stayed for 20 years, serving as a technical sergeant before retiring in 1987. From 1984 to 2004, Philip owned Century 21 Height Realty in Rincon, Georgia, and in 2004, he started working for Coldwell Banker as an associate broker. Philip made a name for himself in the real estate business, and he was very successful. He made literally millions of dollars as a developer of residential, commercial, and industrial properties. He was once the president of the Savannah Board of Realtors, and he was described as being, quote, the best partner you could ask for. In addition to killing it at Realty, Philip also worked in cattle farming and raised pulled Hereford cattle on the Height family farm. Just as he was very involved in the world of real estate, he was also very involved in the world of cattle farming. He was a member of the American Hereford Association, the Georgia Hereford Association, and the Georgia Cattlemen's Association. This guy's very busy. So whenever yeah. I'm complaining about my week, I'm now like, well, I wasn't running any multi-million dollar businesses slash I know, raising cattle. I know. <laughs> we run into so many incredible people in these stories that we do right. where they have this long list of things that they've accomplished or the things that they have their hand in or that they're involved in. And it really does make me think like, I need to do more with my life. What am I doing with my <laughs> <Yeah>. life? <laughs> no, it's amazing. So he really worked very hard, as we were saying, to improve the quality of life for those living in his county. He wanted to really be a part of the growth and development and prosperity of the area. He had his hand in many parts of local society, including once being the president of the Chamber of Commerce. He was also on the board of directors for Citizens Bank of Effingham, and he was on the advisory board for Coastal Georgia Rivers Water and Planning and Policy Committee, and he was chairman of Ebenezer Trustees. I didn't know we had very many Ebenezers outside of the one Scrooge. So right. that was interesting. I didn't either. Yeah. <laughs> so it seems like Philip really had a lot going on for him. Huge professional success, a really strong and stable marriage that had lasted 40 plus years at this point and produced three upstanding sons. What more could a guy really ask for out of life? But all of that came crashing down on August 25th, 2008. It was around 3 o'clock that morning when a 911 operator answered a horrifying call. A woman on the other end gurgled and struggled to articulate the words that she needed to request emergency help. After about six minutes on the phone, the dispatcher was able to make out that the woman was calling from inside of her home and that she had been shot in the mouth. The caller said she didn't know who had shot her or if they were still in the house but that her husband had also been shot and she wasn't sure if her son, who was in the house as well, had been shot. The caller was Linda Height, and she'd just been through one of the worst real-life nightmares you could possibly imagine. On the night before, Linda and Philip were at their home for a normal evening when their youngest son, Carrie, showed up. Carrie had come over after he just had an argument with his wife, Robin. Although Carrie had never gone to his parents' house after a fight, this one was bad enough that he wanted to just take the night to cool off, so he planned to stay the night at his parents' house and then go home the next morning. Later that night, Linda was in the bathroom when she suddenly heard a loud noise, which she thought was the sound of lightning striking Philip's sleep apnea machine, so she came out of the bathroom to see what was going on. When Linda emerged from the bathroom, she said Philip's name. But then immediately after that, she saw a flash and realized that Philip had just been shot. Linda then saw another flash, and this time it was her that had been shot. She was shot through the left side of her face with the bullet continuing on into her shoulder. Miraculously, Linda was still alive. Wow. Yeah, it's just incredible that she lived through this. Uh, she managed to make her way to the phone that was next to her bed. But when she picked it up, she realized that the line had been cut or something was wrong because the line was dead. At that point, Linda blacked out, but she did come to a short while later and saw that her teeth were on the floor next to her and she realized that her clothing were soaked in gasoline. I can't even imagine any of this happening and just not having a clue what's going on. But, oh, my gosh, this is like a real life nightmare, like really a real life nightmare. I can't even picture myself in that situation. Every realization gets worse, right? Like right. it's not bad enough that you've, you know, seen 
been shot and all that. Now your teeth are next to you and you know there's gasoline on you, which isn't by accident. You know something right. worse is coming. Right. Wow. So at this point, Linda blacked out again. But at some point, she doesn't remember how or when, she was able to get to the kitchen and find her cell phone to dial 911. When Linda first connected with the operator, it was difficult for her to communicate at all. The operator couldn't understand Linda very well because she was having a hard time speaking properly due to having been shot in the mouth. My gosh. Oh my gosh, I know. But the operator was able to make out that Linda had been shot and there were other victims in the home. Officers arrived and immediately smelled the overwhelming smell of gas emanating from the house. Once they got inside, the gasoline that was everywhere made the officers even start slipping on the floor. At this point, they realized that even if they were to encounter the suspect inside of this home, they wouldn't be able to fire their weapons because there was so much gasoline and so much fumes that they would be risking blowing themselves up if they were to do that. So that kind of limits going into a situation like that, not knowing if there's still somebody in the house or not. Like that's got, I mean, all around, this is just a horrific situation. Oh my God. And I never would have... (laughs) I would like to think I would have put that together. I don't think I would have put that together. So to have that realization of like, this is a a horrible situation. This is, you know, the worst of the worst. And on top of that, if something goes wrong like that, it it could be the end for everybody. I mean, that's just terrifying. Yeah. So the police did find Linda and she was clinging to life inside of the house. She was missing part of her lower jaw and chin and she had a huge hole in her shoulder. Linda was rushed to Memorial Health University Center, where she underwent emergency life-saving treatment. The next thing Linda remembered was waking up four weeks later in a hospital bed, only to be told the devastating news that her husband, Philip, had in fact been shot and killed that night, and that her youngest son, Carrie, had also been killed in the attack. Oh, my gosh. Carrie Albert Height was born on June 10th, 1976 in Savannah, and he was the last born son to Linda and Philip. Carrie's personality was really the most like his dad, Phillips, and he was also very well liked in childhood and into adulthood. He worked in real estate as well, and he had a great reputation in the business. Carrie actually started Century 21 Height Realty with his dad and also worked with his dad at the Coldwell Banker Real Estate Office. Carrie was very dedicated to his career in real estate. For multiple years, Carrie was recognized by the Savannah Board of Realtors as a Million Dollars Club member. Carrie enjoyed hunting, taking care of his horses, boating, and spending time with his kids. He actually met his wife, Robin, during their senior year of high school in English class. Robin said that Carrie was a very good husband and a wonderful father. The two had three kids who were 11, 8, and 3 when the horrific news that Carrie had been shot to death was delivered. Following these attacks, Effingham County Sheriff Jimmy McDuffie and other officers arrived at the Height home and initially theorized that a murder-suicide had taken place. But once all the gas was removed from the house, they realized that it had to be a murder. Sheriff McDuffie called in the GBI because the county really didn't have enough resources to properly investigate the murders. This was a county that saw about one murder per year, so they were not equipped for something like this. The GBI arrived at the scene at about 8.45 a.m. Agent Eugene Howard immediately believed that the scene looked staged. He felt that someone had tried to make this look like a burglary. The phone lines had been cut and a pane of door glass was smashed, but there was no sign of forced entry. There were no items that were taken from the home, including money and jewelry that were just sitting out in plain sight. So after the shooting, evidence suggested that the assailant staged a burglary and doused the house in gasoline with the intention of setting it on fire, but for whatever reason, the gas was never lit. The most interesting piece of evidence that was actually found at the scene was a key that was left in the deadbolt of the back door. The Heights kept a spare key to that deadbolt hidden outside that only family members knew about, which led the investigation in a direction no one was expecting. Investigators now believe that the shooter must have been someone in the family, or at least someone close enough to the family that would know about the spare key. And we still have so many more details to get into about this story after a quick break to hear word from this week's sponsors. If I told you sleep is one of the most important things you could do for yourself, you'd probably say, a dumb Melissa, tell me something I didn't know. 
So then I say, but did you know sleepers who routinely get sleep using their Sleep Number 360 smart bed features get almost 100 hours more of proven quality sleep per year? And sure, you'd like to pretend that you knew that as well, but instead you're probably figuring out all the cool things you could do with that 100 hours of quality sleep. Maybe you could learn a new language or start a rock band or scroll on your phone for 100 hours on TikTok. I'm not going to judge you. When I'm sleeping on my sleep number setting at a 30, my sleep IQ is between an 85 and a 90, which is incredible as someone who has always struggled with getting a good night's sleep. My sleep number bed is purely magic. It helps me get that quality sleep that helps me out during my waking hours. Having a good night's sleep means I'm less burnout, less of a grump, and even have less cravings. Sleep is basically magic, which is why not getting sleep makes you, well, less than magical. And I've discovered that my perfect sleep number setting is a 30, but occasionally I even go down to a 25 for an even softer, fluffier experience. I always wake up feeling like I got the best night of sleep, and my sleep IQ score of 87 confirms that I am sleeping better than ever. Discover special offers now for a limited time at your local sleep number store or sleepnumber.com slash moms. Sleep number, proven quality sleep is life-changing sleep. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. I'm someone who can spiral very quickly into negative thinking. It's something I've really always done, and sometimes I just really need help talking things through. And being able to talk to my BetterHelp therapist has been incredibly helpful. BetterHelp is here to help you with whatever you're going through. Whether you have anxiety, depression, or just need to work through some immediate struggles, BetterHelp is there. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. One thing I really appreciate is that I can write my therapist in the middle of the week if there's something I know I want to touch on in our next session, so there's a nice line of communication between us. Another reason we love BetterHelp is because it's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Moms and Murder listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash moms. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash moms. And now back to the episode. So before the break, we just talked about this absolutely horrific shooting um, in the Height family home that left Philip Height and Carrie Height dead, and Linda Height uh, was fighting for her life. DNA evidence was never collected from the Height home after the shooting because the investigators thought that this was a hands-off attack, meaning it was a shooting, so they, I guess, felt that there was no reason that the shooter's DNA would be present um, in the attacks or at the scene. I don't think that makes a lot of sense to me. I feel like I there's just, still plenty of ways you could have DNA left behind. But Wouldn't it be better to just get as much as you can and then rule stuff out? Then yeah. yeah. I don't know. That was kind of bizarre to me. I, I agree with you. Yeah. So they did dust for fingerprints and they did find fingerprints. But due to the surfaces being frequently touched, because of course this is a house where people right. live, there were many fingerprints that were just layered you know, on top of each other, which makes them useless to the investigators. Since they believed that the shooting had to have been committed by a family member, the investigators started looking into Chris and Craig, as well as Carrie's wife, Robin. About a month before the murders, Carrie had actually contacted Officer McDuffie and told him that he believed his wife, Robin, was having an affair. Further investigation revealed this to be true, but the person Robin was having an affair with was somebody that no one ever saw coming. Robin was cheating on Carrie with his own brother, Craig. The affair began in early 2008 at a time when Carrie was spending more and more time at the real estate office. He was home less often and became more distant from Robin and the family. The real estate market at this time was not really doing well, but Carrie never talked to his wife about, you know, any of this or about the stresses that he was having. In April of 2008, Robin made a move on Craig. She told him that she had feelings for him that were more than just the regular brother and sister-in-law feelings. Melissa, have you ever experienced this? <laughs> I just want to understand what those feelings are. Like my both my brother in laws, great people, right? End of list. I mean, that's it. They're, I mean, I love them both, but yeah, no, mm -mm, don't get this. This doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. So Craig said that he felt the same way towards Robin, and they started having a full blown affair. 
After a little while of this, Carrie started to become suspicious and Robin developed a little bit of a guilty conscience. She ended up telling Carrie about the affair because she felt that he already knew something was going on because she hadn't been acting like herself lately. Carrie was extremely upset, angry, hurt, just absolutely devastated that his wife was having an affair with his brother. That is just like the ultimate betrayal from all sides yeah. coming at him. And it's like, who do you turn to? You know, right. like, it's 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 I can't even imagine. Mm-mm. So Carrie told Robin that, uh, you know, he wished it was anybody else Um you know, but he did still want to work things out with her. And as for Craig, he was not going to be able to be a part of their lives or their children's lives. It goes without saying that Carrie was very anti-divorce. He really wanted to go to counseling and work on the problems in their marriage. So that is what he convinced Robin to do. Okay. So this is so hard because he's married and he has these two kids. So they're connected forever, right? Him and his wife. Right. And then his brother, you're connected with your brother forever. So these two people, like you were saying, it just, it it's hard for me to wrap my mind around because it is so personal for that to be, it to be somebody so close to you. Yeah. Man. So after Carrie learns about this affair, he really needed someone to confide in. And it wasn't long before he turned to his dad, Philip. When Philip learns that his two sons are in the midst of this type of major chaotic event, he was extremely upset. Philip was very angry with Robin, and he made it known to her, to the point that Robin even went to his office and told him to stay out of the affair. Philip told her that he couldn't just stay out of it because it involved two of his sons. So Philip warned Craig that he better knock it off with his brother's wife or he would lose his entire inheritance. When Linda finds out about the affair, she also really gave Robin the cold shoulder. She thought that Carrie and Robin would end up getting a divorce and that Craig and Robin would continue to see each other. And I can't imagine as a mom looking at this situation and thinking like, how will Christmas look? Right. How? Holidays and like <laughs> Holidays. every family event. Like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh. what a Everything's nightmare. now fractured, really. And like just the relationship with your grandkids and how they're going to feel about the whole thing. It's just, it's a lot. And so even after this shocking news that the affair comes to light, Craig and Robin continue to see each other. Robin said that Craig was giving her all this attention that Carrie wasn't, but there was definitely a lot of tension and a lot of heated conversations happening, as one would expect in this situation. So during one conversation about the affair in August of 2008, Robin claimed that Philip pushed her, yelled at her, and took her keys from her when she tried to leave. Again, Philip is her father-in-law. Also in early August, Carrie changed his life insurance policy to remove Robin as the beneficiary of his $3.5 million life insurance payout. Instead, he chose to put that money into a trust for his kids. So a few days before the shooting, Philip also changed his will and decreased the amount of money that Craig would receive after Philip passed. So to say tensions were definitely high at this point is kind of an understatement. It's just you're... People are messing with their money. It's emotional family stuff. It's everything. So people around town are even gossiping about this affair between Craig and Robin and how it was destroying this family from the inside out. But still, the affair continued. Sometime in August, Craig contacted a real estate agent about a listing for a house on two acres that was $235,000. He was also interested in an opportunity to purchase land for $7,000 an acre, or he could just buy the house and the two acres it was on, plus another 20 acres for a total of $325,000, which is a really good deal, by the way. Yeah. So the realtor uh, named Christy Campo, obviously she knew the Height family because Philip and Carrie are both in the real estate business too, so she is familiar with this family. So she says to Craig, you know, why aren't you just using your dad and your brother as your realtors? So Craig told her that he was not on good terms with his family and that he was what he called the black sheep. He went so far as to say that if his father was on fire, he, you know, the saying, wouldn't do anything to put him out. I was like, are you going to say it? (laughs) No, (laughs) I'm not going to say it. But when Christy asked Craig how he was going to be able to pay, you know, how he would be paying for this house and the land, Craig told her that he had some timberland he could sell off. But later, when Christy looked up the tax records, she couldn't find any evidence that Craig actually owned any timberland. So on the evening of August 23rd, 2008, Robin was supposed to attend. So Robin is Carrie's wife. She was supposed to attend a slumber party at a co-worker's house. 
I guess adults do slumber parties. I don't know. I've never been invited to one if they do. So one of the invited co-workers unfortunately got sick. So the whole slumber party was called off. Now, Carrie, of course, already thinks Robin's going to be out all night because she's supposed to be at a slumber party. So Robin decided, hey, this is a perfect opportunity for me to go and spend the night with Craig in his cabin instead of just going home since my party was canceled or instead of staying home, rather. But not so fast. If Robin thought that she was fooling anybody, she was really mistaken. Philip had long been suspicious that Robin was meeting his son Craig at his cabin to carry on the affair, and he'd been brainstorming ways to prove it. Philip actually hired his friend Ellis to fly over Craig's cabin in a helicopter and take pictures to prove that Robin and Craig were still having this affair. So I just don't I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, this is a lot. And I mean, I feel like everyone kind of knew it was going on. I don't feel like you need that much proof. She literally said it was going on. Right. So there's no secret here. Yeah, I don't really get it. But, I feel like you could have driven up to the property and taken a picture instead of hiring a helicopter to go yeah, in the skies. Yeah, that's uh, – it's over the top. It's over the top for sure. But you know what? I guess it's all about who you know. I don't know anyone with a helicopter, but if I did, maybe, Dang it, I, would, Mandy. <laughs> maybe I would use them for something you know like what? this. I don't we know. We need <laughs> a slumber party where we're picked up in a helicopter and brought somewhere else. I don't know about that life. I don't no, have any, absolutely um, not. friends with a helicopter. I don't um, have any friends. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so on the morning of August 24th, after Robin had been at the cabin all night long, the helicopter showed up and hovered over the cabin for a few minutes. So Robin hears, you know, the noise from this, and she suspected that Philip had sent the helicopter. So she talked to Craig about how she feels that his father, Philip, is meddling and just really trying to control the situation, which give the guy a break. Craig told Robin that if his dad and brother weren't careful, he would go, quote, old school on them. I don't know what that means. I'm sure it's not a good thing. Yeah, no, no, it doesn't sound positive. <laughs> So Robin left and left the cabin, and she arrived home later that day at around lunchtime. Carrie and the kids weren't home because they had gone to church that morning. So Robin made lunch for the family and waited for them to get back. Later that afternoon, Carrie and Robin had a nasty argument. It's the one that we mentioned before that led to Carrie wanting to stay the night at his parents' house in the first place. After Carrie left that evening, Robin immediately called Craig and told him about the fight that she just had with Carrie. So Craig asked Robin where Carrie went, and she said that he had gone to their parents' house, to which Craig simply replied, okay. It was just hours later when someone entered the Height home and opened fire on everyone inside. The attack left Philip and Carrie dead, and as we said, Linda fighting for her life in the hospital. When investigators learned about the secret affair, they went to speak with Robin to confirm this theory. She admitted that she had been having this affair with Craig, so they started looking into where she was on the night of the murders. Interestingly enough, police learned that Carrie must have hired a private investigator to track Robin himself because they actually found a tracking device on Robin's car. And that device actually proved that Robin was at her house on the night of the murders. So she has an alibi. So, Oh my god! <laughs> I know. Like, that's got to be such a – I mean, that's like a whole – a whole different level of things that are going on here. But how crazy for the police, like, um, starting this investigation and then realizing, like, that sh this woman already has a tracking device on her car. Like, can you imagine them just being like, what is going on here? <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. I can't imagine. And, like, thank you for doing our work for us. They just, you know, figured that out. That's, like, got to be a help to know we can cross her off the list. She really could not have done this. So police spoke with Philip and Linda's other son, Chris, next. They learned that he actually owned a 12-gauge shotgun, which was the same type of gun used in the slaying of his family members. Chris denied having anything to do with the murders, though, and said that he was in bed when the shooting happened. A test of his shotgun proved that it hadn't been fired recently, and investigators determined that Chris was not a suspect in the murders. The only person that was left to investigate was Craig. During interviews with police, Craig was asked multiple times if he was having an affair with his brother's wife, Robin. And each time, Craig answered no. He alleged that Robin only came to his house on the night of August 23rd because she needed to take a shower before she went to a baby shower. Craig said, quote, I know it looks bad, but I'm going to tell you something. I could never do that to my brother, end quote. Yikes. 
So detectives asked Craig what he would say if they told him that Robin had already admitted to this affair with him and told the police that the couple had been sleeping together. Craig said that it was a lie and that he never slept with Robin. They asked if he was calling Robin a liar, and Craig said no. Craig was then asked point blank if Robin hired someone to kill Carrie. He said, quote, there is no way Robin had anything to do with that, end quote. Craig couldn't provide an alibi for the police, which didn't look good considering he was the only person who didn't have one. Craig surmised that Carrie and Philip were having trouble with the real estate business and that the only family money they had left would have been in life insurance policies. He then alleges that his brother Chris was the only person who could gain anything from the deaths since he'd been the only beneficiary to his father's estate now that he, Craig, had been taken out of the will. So literally saying, you know what, take the focus off me because there's one person here that you know, stands to get money and that's my other brother. Wow. Look at him. Wow. Wow. So through the investigation, the police realized that the recoil from the shotgun that was used in the murders most likely would have left bruises on whoever pulled the trigger. So they asked Craig to take off his shirt. And sure enough, he had bruises on his upper arm that were consistent with being a couple of days old. Craig claimed that these bruises were from falling out of the shower headfirst into the toilet. And he even took it a step further and made a reenactment video of this fall for the police. (laughs) (laughs) just the science behind that i don't quite get how you go from your shower head first into your toilet but and bruise your arm yeah (laughs) yeah and and your arm is what got hurt in that situation yeah i just like i i imagine the police though like they're just trolling him at this point being like okay we're gonna set up a reenactment and we want to watch exactly how this went down and like they're just making him do this like knowing that that's not what happened you know but like how it's just I, I would love to see that video of him doing Me too. That. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> so the GBI investigators wanted to go to Craig's cabin to look for more evidence. They saw that there were no sheets on the bed when they got there, just a comforter. And Craig told them that he had slept on the couch that night. But interestingly, the sheets for the bed in the cabin were never found. They actually didn't find anything else of use in the cabin. So that was kind of a dead end. Craig provided a list of all the weapons that he owned, and on this list was a Remington 870 shotgun. And the investigators noticed that that gun in particular was missing from his actual stash of weapons. They searched his truck and found three-inch Magnum shells, which matched the type of shells that were used in the shooting. In the face of all the evidence against him, Craig started telling the police things without any prompting or questioning. This is something we've seen before when somebody that's guilty just like they just have a guilty conscious I guess and they're trying not to draw attention to themselves but right all they're really doing is just talking and blabbing and just saying everything so that's kind of what he was doing he randomly told them that his shotgun boots and gas can were missing and the police thought this was suspicious because they at that point hadn't even told anybody that a shotgun is what was used in the murder so mm. For him to just be randomly bringing up, you know, oh, my shotgun is missing. They're like, oh, is that right? You know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So Craig lied to the police about things that he didn't even need to be lying about. And he even took a polygraph and lied during that, too. One of the questions on the polygraph was something along the lines of, did you kill your father and brother and shoot your mother in the face? And Craig said he didn't know. And if he did, he didn't remember it. Oof, these are yes or no questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yikes. An autopsy was conducted on Philip and Carrie on August the 26th. The findings showed that 59-year-old Philip and 32-year-old Carrie had each been shot one time. Carrie was shot first in the face, mm-hmm. and then the shooter went up to Philip in Linda's room. Linda was in the bathroom when Philip was shot in the face, and she was shot when she came out. The doctor performing the autopsies, this is crazy, this piece of information. So the doctor that was performing the autopsies said that if Linda hadn't turned her head at the exact moment that the bullet made impact, she would have been dead instantly. Wow. So the shots were fired from very close range, most likely from just about two feet away. So you can just, it is incredible that Linda survived this shooting. Oh my gosh, yeah. And being shot in the face, like this is such a personal. With a shotgun. Oh my gosh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the amount of vitriol somebody has to have. So meanwhile, Linda was in the hospital recovering from her gunshot wounds. Police were hoping that she would eventually be able to identify the person who was responsible for shooting her. 
Officers told the hospital staff to monitor Linda's vital signs whenever she had visitors, particularly whenever her two living sons, Chris and Craig, came to visit. When Chris visited Linda in the hospital, her vitals remained stable and normal. But when Craig visited, her blood pressure spiked and her pulse rose. At this time, Linda couldn't talk, but her eyes got wide and she was shaking. Linda later said she didn't believe she had this reaction due to fear, but who knows. And also, keep in mind, Craig at this point, you know, playing devil, devil's advocate here, he had been wreaking havoc on this family, like having an affair, and there's been so much turmoil that it's not crazy that she's seeing him and could be having some kind of reaction outside right. of this, right? Like right. There, it, there's just been so much. So a few weeks later, Linda had jaw reconstruction surgery and she was finally able to talk. She told police, though, that she really wasn't able to give them much. She didn't see a face or anything that day. She also said that she did not see Craig in the room, and all she saw was the gunshot blast. Linda went so far as to tell the investigator that she was absolutely sure her son Craig did not commit this horrible act. She said, quote, I know my child. I know the man he is. I know the heart he has. He does not have a cold-blooded heart. I can be certain that Craig did not do this to our family, end quote. Linda looked Craig in his eyes and asked him for herself if he did this, and he told her no, that he didn't, and he couldn't do it. Oh my gosh, this story is so heartbreaking. It is. And so we still have more to get into after one last break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. If you love listening to our show, we know you love a good whodunit more than most. And if you're looking for another way to tickle that itch, look no further than June's Journey. June's Journey is a free-to-download game following June Parker, an amateur detective investigating a series of mysteries with twists and turns around every corner. I'm always solving mysteries in my house like, where are my kids' shoes? Or who could have spilled this juice everywhere? So I really excel at June's Journey. While enjoying the glamour of the Roaring Twenties, I can put on my Sherlock hat and really help solve mysteries as June Parker, who has a much more glamorous life than I do. I mean, we can't all be solving mysteries while looking chic, but with June, I sort of feel like I am. I really enjoy playing June's Journey while vegging out at night or just taking a break before breaking up another argument of my kids over who has to clean the dishes. Spoiler alert, it will probably be me. I'm in chapter two, and what's great is there are new chapters added every week, so you always have something new and exciting to look forward to. You guys will love the beautiful and immersive scenes filled with drama, danger, and heck, even a little romance. Ready to awaken your inner detective? Download June's Journey free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. In my barely 30 years on Earth, one thing I've always struggled with is my relationship with food. I've spent years of looking at pizza like it's bad and broccoli like it's good. Thanks to Noom, I've learned that food is just that. It's food. There's no need to label it because Noom doesn't believe in restricting what you can have or what you can't. In actuality, Noom is designed to give you the knowledge to help you make informed choices that not only fit your lifestyle, but also to help you reach your goals. Unlike other programs, with Noom, you are the boss, and you decide how it fits into your life, not the other way around. Whether you want to spend 5, 10, or 15 minutes a day, how much you spend on the app is totally up to you, and Noom is all about results. In fact, more than 75% of their users will complete the program. For me, using Noom was all about feeling better and eating better. Since using Noom, the thing I really love the most is not having this feeling of failure if I veer off track. Noom is all about progress, not perfection, which is something I've been missing, and it's made a huge difference. Eating better helps with my mood and stress level, and Noom helps me achieve that. My favorite part of the app is really the flexibility. I'm able to do as much or as little as I want without feeling like I'm failing myself. Sign up for your trial and get psychology-based support and motivation to reach your goals at noom.com slash moms. That's noom.com slash moms to sign up for your trial. It's been a while since I've had a baby of my own, and some days I miss it so much. The baby cuddles and baby smiles, but when it comes to diaper rashes, not so much. I remember the first time my oldest had a diaper rash, I was really devastated. Here's this tiny thing totally dependent on me, and now she's fussy and obviously uncomfortable, and I'm supposed to have the answers. Well, with time and treatment, it went away, but what I really wanted was to avoid it altogether. And now, baby butts rejoice. New Huggies Skin Essentials are here. A brand new dermatologist-approved line of diapers, wipes, and pull-ups training pants, all designed with baby's sensitive skin in mind. The wipes are thick and have zero harsh ingredients for a great, gentle clean. 
Pull-Up Skin Essentials has got your big kid covered too, with a training pant that's ultra soft and breathable to help protect sensitive skin throughout potty training. Whether you're a first-time parent or a seasoned pro, make it easy on yourself and your baby with Huggies. Learn more at Huggies.com. Once again, head to Huggies.com to learn more. Now back to the episode. So the investigators have been working on this case to find out what happened in the Height home, and they have talked to over 100 people while trying to figure out what happened here. But they still only had circumstantial evidence, which was the affair, the lying, the missing items, the bruises on Craig's arm. They really still needed something more concrete if they were going to make an arrest. So the GBI continued to quietly investigate Craig and Robin. Rumors began to spread around town regarding what happened at the Height home. Some suggested that the murders were mafia-related, while others said that it was due to a real estate deal gone wrong. Others thought that the Heights could have been killed by drug dealers who lived nearby. But after about four months, the case was still open. In December of 2008, Craig and Robin decided enough time had passed, and they resumed their relationship. At first, Craig was spending the night at Robin's house as many as four nights a week. But in January of 2009, he moved in full time. That is so awkward with his brother's kids there. Yeah. But you know what? I I have heard of these stories where, I mean, you've heard of them where people, somebody dies in the family and then somebody marries their brother. Like you hear of those. But it wasn't going on prior. Like that's where it's like, oh, this is, this is mess. This is mess. Yeah. Yeah. So Robin and Carrie's children um, were not aware of the relationship that Robin was having with their uncle, but Craig still did things with Robin and the kids as a family. They acted like everything was really fine. Robin said, quote, we had each other. I lost a lot more than Carrie. I lost probably every friend I had because of my relationship with Craig. I had a best friend for 15 years and she stayed with me for another month and then she left. It was very stressful. My family wanted to be there for me, but they didn't approve of the relationship. At the end of the 2009 school year, Robin and Craig decided to get married and moved to Charleston. They bought each other rings and seemed really committed to this idea. But then Robin actually started having second thoughts and she told her sister-in-law that she didn't really want Craig to move to Charleston with her and the kids. She said that she didn't really want to hurt Craig's feelings, but she was ready to move on from the whole thing now. During this time, Robin started taking a lot of different medication because she was having a really hard time coping just with everything that had happened. She said that she couldn't stop thinking about how, you know, her husband Carrie died so emotionally hurt because of her and because of this affair that she had been having. So now some time has passed and she's having a little bit of guilt setting in, it seems like. Yeah. After nine months of investigating Craig and trying to find a more solid link between him and the murder of his father and brother, police resigned themselves to the fact that they simply weren't going to find anymore. They decided to go out on a limb and arrest him anyway. They felt like it was really worth a shot. So on May 28th, 2009, he was indicted on numerous charges. He was indicted on the murder of Philip, the murder of Carrie, aggravated assault of Linda with intent to murder, aggravated assault of Linda with a deadly weapon, aggravated battery of Linda, burglary with intent to commit arson, attempt to commit arson in the first degree, possession of a firearm during commission of the crime of murder of Philip, possession of a firearm during commission of the crime of the murder of Carrie, possession of a firearm during commission of the crime of aggravated battery upon Linda. After Craig's arrest, Robin was still convinced that he was innocent. And for that matter, so did Linda and Chris, his mom and his brother. Oh, man. Yeah. So the details of this are not known due to a gag order, but on February 2nd, 2010, Robin found herself in trouble for threatening a witness. She was arrested and ordered to move to Charleston until the trial. In August of 2010, she decided to start cooperating, so the judge let her come back to Georgia before the trial, and the charge against her was later dropped. Robin stopped talking to Craig after February of 2010, after she realized that it was possible that he was, in fact, the shooter. So Craig's trial began on December 1st, 2010 at the Superior Court of Effingham County, Georgia. Prosecutors said that when Craig found out his brother had gone to their parents' house on August 24th, 2008, he thought that this was the perfect opportunity to rid himself of all these people that were standing in the way of his affair with Robin. 
They alleged that Craig went to the Height home and cut the phone lines. Then he broke in with a spare key, attacked his family with his Remington 870 shotgun, which, by the way, was suspiciously never located by the police. And then they said that Craig picked up all the spent shells after the shooting and then doused the house in gasoline, but didn't get a chance to set it on fire because he realized his mother was alive and had called 911. I kind of made a note to myself here, but he must have been there for a while before because she, she was, was even like able in and to out call of consciousness. Yeah, I thought that too, but I don't know. You know, who knows? And if he thought, I see, I just don't know. I don't know. It is strange yeah. that the gasoline was poured, but it was never lit. So it does make you wonder, like, what stopped that from happening? Right. I mean, thank goodness, but it is just kind of like it's just another thing on uh, in this story, really. So Craig smashes this pane of glass on his way out the door and he fled the scene, but he forgot to take the key out of the deadbolt. So what's the point if you have this pane of glass broken? You obviously got in with the key, you know? So as for motive, prosecutors told the jury all about Craig's affair with Robin and how there was a $3.5 million life insurance policy on his brother, Carrie. If Craig killed Carrie and then married Robin, he'd be able to have part of that $3.5 million. And if he killed his father, he'd get a share of his father's estate too. They pointed out how Craig was preemptively looking at property to buy just before the murders, which may indicate that he'd been planning it for a while. Prosecutors also said that Craig was led by lust and greed. He wanted his brother's life and he wanted his brother's wife. The defense told the jury that since the police were so focused on Craig, they never even looked into the possibility that anybody else could have committed this crime. They pointed out the lack of DNA evidence, fingerprints, eyewitnesses, or confessions that would tie Craig to these murders. His defense said that he was charged with murder due to gossip, rumor, and conjecture, and that having an affair with his brother's wife and lying about it doesn't make him a murderer. The defense also argued that Craig had those three spent shell casings in his truck because he was a hunter. Robin testified in the trial and said that she used Carrie's life insurance money to pay for Craig's first lawyer, but that she had no involvement in the attack on the Height family. Linda also testified that the person who shot her was a slender man. The prosecution had Carrie and Robin's marriage counselor get on the stand and testified that Craig had threatened to kill Carrie at their parents' house in the past before. On December 9th, 2010, after the jury of four men and eight women deliberated for six hours, Craig was found guilty on all 11 counts that he was charged with. A month later, he was sentenced to two life sentences for the murders and 85 years for the other nine charges, all to be served consecutively. About a year after the verdict was handed down, Craig's defense team found more information that ended up leading to an appeal. They learned that sometime before the trial began, Robin actually brought a Remington 870 shotgun to her friend Walter Dumas, who did gun repairs, and she asked him to repair this gun. At the time, Walter didn't think anything of it, so he took it like it was any other job. But then when the trial started and he heard that the police thought a Remington 870 was the murder weapon and the Philip and Carrie case, he went home and looked at the gun that Robin gave him and realized that, sure enough, it was a match to the one that the police had been looking for. Oh. Yeah. So he called the police and turned the gun over to them immediately. Craig's defense claimed that they were never notified about the gun that Walter handed into the police, but if they knew about it, they would have brought it up in the trial as the possible murder weapon. The gun was actually registered to carry. So at first I was like, why would the defense care? Like, it's good for them, right, right if they don't find it. But I guess that was like what they – I don't know where they were going to try and go with that. I guess they were going to try and say like it wasn't even Craig's weapon. So, right. you know, something along those lines. So the prosecutor said that the judge from Craig's trial was notified about the gun. But the judge and the attorneys decided together that the information about the gun didn't warrant delaying the trial. So for those reasons, Craig filed a motion for a new trial on the grounds that his defense didn't know about the gun that Robin gave to Walter. The Superior Court ended up finding that there was no evidence proving that the defense didn't know about the gun, so the motion was denied in February of 2012. On March 8, 2012, Craig appealed the Superior Court's decision to the Georgia Supreme Court. Ten months later, his appeal was denied. As of this day, Craig's mother, Linda, and his brother, Chris, both believe that Craig is innocent, even after this guilty verdict. Linda refuses to comment on whether or not she believes Robin had anything to do with the attack that took her husband and son from her. 
After the trial, the local residents still felt like Robin was involved, and they would ask the sheriff when she was going to be arrested. Sheriff McDuffie assured them that if any evidence of her involvement ever came to light, she too would be arrested. As of now, there's no evidence that Robin participated or planned any part of the murders. Due to a court order, Robin actually shares custody of her and Carrie's children with Linda. In November of 2011, Robin remarried and moved to Charleston with her three kids and new husband. Craig is incarcerated in Georgia State Prison. Oh my goodness. I don't even, this is such a terrible, such a sad story. Yeah, there's a lot of layers in this story and just there's a lot going on. You know what um, sticks out to me? Like whenever I hear that Chris and Linda think Craig didn't have anything to do with this, it's kind of like, what? I don't get it. But then I think they're victims of this whole thing. I mean, I, I feel like I can't imagine because with a family, with your brother or your son to like admit that they murdered, you know, other members of your family. That's like, I I just don't know if I could handle it like mentally. So I can kind of see how they would prefer to believe in his innocence. And yeah, I mean, just, I don't know. Crazier like things said. have happened. Yeah. But I, I don't know. Like whenever I heard that, it just kind of was like, oh man, I don't, I don't get it, but I, I can't get it. If you think from being a mom and like you were just yeah. saying, you can see how like just hope upon hope that there was a chance that it didn't happen, you would hold on to whatever you could. So Absolutely. I definitely get that. Super yeah. sad story. All right. So are we ready to turn the page and go to last thing before we go? Yes, ma'am. Let's do that. And for those that are new to listening, because we've had uh, some new listeners, last thing before we go is the last thing we do before we go. We just kind of talk about nonsense, things that really don't have to do with anything, just as a little palate cleanser at the end of the episode. So you can go into your next podcast on an up and up. Yeah. At, at, <laughs> I don't know what that what that I'm trying to say, but you, you get it. Up. Yes. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm literally saying on a up and up. Okay. Not even using the right grammar there. Mandy, we decided to look up uh, fun facts about real estate. There was a little real estate ishness to this story. Um, and so we just looked up really bizarre real estate facts. Do you yeah. want to kick it off with a fun fact you found? Yes, I have so many. And I hope this is what you're looking for because some of it I was just like, huh, it's really interesting. You understood the assignment. I did. Okay, Melissa. So the first thing I have, maybe this is something that you knew. I did not know this. But did you know that there are thousands of homes right here in Orlando that are built on top of an old World War II bombing range? And residents have been discovering old bombs there since 1998. I don't know where this is. And I want to find out, like, what neighborhood is this? Ma'am. No. I. <laughs> that was not a fun fact I found. Whoa. <laughs> that's wild. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Ooh, I don't like that at all. <laughs> Can you all right, imagine you finding that? Ooh, no, thank no. you. Okay. In 2007, real estate magnate and hotelier – how do you say that word? Hotelier. 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 Yeah. Hotelier. Whatever Mandy just said. <laughs> Leona Hemsley left $12 million in her will to her dog named Treble, making it the richest dog in the world at the time. Wait, at the time – Oh my gosh, Who's, somebody left their dog more who, than $12 million. I love that the dog's name is Trouble, though. Like, yeah, no, this is going to be a problem. Thanks for screwing everybody else over having to deal with getting $12 million to your dog. Can you imagine having to figure that situation out? But then what Maybe happens just, when the dog dies? I just, like, don't understand people do that. Do they have, like, a plan for, like, when the dog passes? Then, like, it's like, okay, just kidding. Now the real people get the money. Like, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't either. It doesn't make any sense to me. Or maybe the dog just has, like, a really cool dog house. We don't right. know his life. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, okay, so here's something that is a little different, a little outside the box, but I guess technically is kind of real estate-esque. Most people don't realize this, but did you know that the Egyptian pyramids are not actually out in the middle of like nowhere like you would expect, but I found this aerial view that the pyramids are right next to the city of Cairo. So like it's what? really bizarre so yeah like it's right outside the city so wouldn't you expect the pyramids to be in the middle of like the desert with nothing at all around them i mean honestly i've never thought about it but yeah in my head that's how it was i didn't think google maps was just driving on the road next to it but then if you think people are going to see it it has to be kind of close to something right i mean never yeah. would have guessed it 
Yeah, but it's just like right on the edge of town. Like I don't know, it just makes it feel like it makes it feel fake to me now. Like I don't even want to go there. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is oh, like Oh, Mandy just sent me a picture. That is wild. Isn't that weird? It looks like just the world's biggest beach and like a couple <laughs> people stayed out there and <laughs> built really cool sandcastles. Yeah, yeah, I had Oh man, this is just going to be an episode or a uh, last thing before we go where we sound really bright. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're both like I had no idea. Okay, Mandy, I've got an interesting one. Have you heard of the story of a guy that bought a house for just one paperclip? No. <laughs> so there's this guy named Kyle McDonald. Uh, he's a Canadian blogger, and he started off with one red paperclip, and he kept trading up for it. So he'd trade like a paperclip for a piece of paper, a piece of paper for a stapler, whatever. And he would do this all on like Craigslist and stuff until eventually after 14 online trades over the course of a year, he – gets a house like I don't remember what, what? the last few were oh my gosh yeah he just kept trading with the goal of getting a house it reminds me of Dwight Schrute in one of the office episodes where he like trades things like a melted candle um up to something but it ends up getting magic beans but anyway it's the same kind of idea but like he said it was inspired by this game called bigger better that kids played never heard of it where you would hmm. go door to door this is before we were all terrified of being kidnapped all the time. And you would bring something to somebody's door and say, do you have something bigger or better you trade me for? And so if they, if you have something, they would trade with you, you know, if they liked what you had and you would just keep going oh around. Oh my gosh. Imagine trying, imagine playing that game, going door to door and like. The way I have my <laughs> daughter's phone like tracked of where she is every single minute. <laughs> Not happening. No, I agree. So Melissa, if the White House were to go up for sale, how much do you think it would be valued at? What would be the price? What would be the listing price of the White House? Okay. I'm going to say a cool 15 mil. You're going to have to bump those numbers up. <laughs> Is it just because it's the White House or because of the property? Um, I – well, I mean, I don't know. 100 mil, final It's how offer. much do you think the White House has been valued at, I guess. I, I'm sure it's been appraised. This is the figure I got. It's okay. $130 million. <gasps> no, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. No. Okay. Wild. Okay, let's see. In Michigan, there was a man whose house was scheduled for demolition. And so he decided to take the numbers off of his home and switch it with a neighbor's home. And the neighbor's house was actually the one that ended up being demolished. I don't know how true oh, that no. one is because it feels a little <laughs> fake, but that's crazy, right? Like, can you yeah. imagine that? Well, I mean, points for creativity and getting yourself out of a jam, but let's let's use those brains for something else there, buddy. Wow. Okay, I have one last one. Okay. And um, I like this one because I just love it when people are like a little bit salty and a little bit like sneaky. So I, this one made me laugh. So in a competition to build the world's tallest building, the architect of the Chrysler building secretly built it with a 125 foot long spire inside. So when his competitor's building was completed, the spire was pushed up through the building, making it taller by 119 feet. I love it so much. I That's do too. That's just oh, so good. <laughs> Can you imagine the just feeling like being able to do that and look at what you've done? Like, oh, that's just, yes. that's winning. That is winning. <laughs> Yes. And before we go, we're going to play a promo for Housewives of True Crime. Uh, Gretchen and Tabitha, they do a great job with that show. They are hilarious. You will definitely want to check them out. So uh, wait and listen to that. All right, guys. We will see you next week. Same time, same place. New story. Have a great week. Bye. Hey, Moms and Murder listeners. Do you need more true crime in your life? Who doesn't? If you like Moms and Murder as much as we do, we know you'll love us too. We are housewives of true crime. Talking crime in the carpool line. And, you know, drinking wine in bed by nine. That's right. Check us out wherever you are listening now. Housewives of True Crime podcast. Clink, clink. Clink, clink. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms and Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much.